at the beginning of Acts chapter 15. And this is a this is a meaty chapter. There's some really important stuff happening here uh, that's very important for all Christians to understand. Uh, and it's not an accident that it's right in the middle of Acts uh, as a book. <clears throat> so it's really the, the pivot point uh, in the whole, it's the central narrative in the whole of Acts probably. So you got a couple of things happening. You know, you have the two, um, you have these, these two stories unfolding in the first part of Acts where you have Peter and specifically his the kind of revelation that he had uh, with Cornelius, the, the Gentile. And then uh, you have Paul's conversion. So for the first half of Acts, you know, we really don't get too much of a focus on Paul. It's only now <clears throat> in the last two chapters, Paul kind of starts to emerge. After Acts 15, uh, Paul is going to become the main hero of the rest of Acts. Um, so 13, chapters 13 and 14, we had Paul's first missionary journey uh, where he goes with Barnabas, uh, out from Antioch, the church in Antioch sends him out, <clears throat> led by the Holy Spirit. He ends up going uh, to Cyprus and the north into what is today Turkey and kind of circulating in this province uh, of southern Galatia. So kind of south central modern day Turkey and evangelizing several uh, cities there. And then they come back to Antioch. And that's how we ended uh, chapter 14. As they return to Antioch, they report all, all the um, uh, wonderful things that took place during their journey. And the, the church in Antioch uh, rejoices. All right. So in, remember, this: the church in Antioch is a real kind of center of Christianity, especially as the a model, let's say, of the uh, a place where there was a large existing Jewish population, synagogues in, in this major city of Antioch, but also many Gentiles um, who were interested in Judaism and have now become Christian, whereas really in Jerusalem and, and the church there, it was also a strong church, but they just didn't have the the number of Gentiles uh, who are interested in Judaism and becoming Christian, whereas Antioch did. <clears throat> and so this, is, this really opens up um, the whole issue being dealt with here is how how does the church deal with these Gentiles, these non-Jews who are becoming Christians? <clears throat> in Jerusalem, it really wasn't an issue, wasn't in their frame of reference. It's almost like, you know, again, I see a similarity to try to <clears throat> bring it home. You know, when I was a, a priest in Greece, for example, you know, 99.99% uh, of the population is Orthodox. <clears throat> and so there are certain issues that just never come up. The issue of um, an Orthodox person marrying a non-Orthodox person. <clears throat> it just, I mean, it's started to come up now in recent years in Greece, but it's just really not an issue, whereas it's been an issue here in the United States for many decades because the Orthodox are such a small uh, percentage of the population, it's almost inevitable that they're going to marry non-Orthodox. <clears throat> and so this issue of uh, how is the church going to deal with this issue of Orthodox marrying non-Orthodox? Well, it really first came to a head here in America or in England or in Australia where the Greeks immigrated. And the church in Greece really, it was a non-issue. So that almost something similar <coughs> happening in Jerusalem versus Antioch. All right. So chapter 14, like we said, Paul and Barnabas return. Uh, they they, they uh, talk about the success of the gospel uh, during their first missionary journey. <clears throat> some Jews uh, accepted the good news, the gospel. Uh, some rejected it quite uh, violently sometimes, in, uh, as we learned in chapter 14. And also some uh, Gentiles accepted it. <clears throat> so, and the people in Antioch are glad about this. All right, so fifth, chapter 15. <clears throat> And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So what does it mean? So certain men, this is kind of a stilted translation. It really, as it's translated here, some, it's just some, some people, some men, and it says came down from Judea. Well, actually it's, it's north from, from Judea up to Antioch is a considerable distance north, but it's uh, the, uh, 
in the biblical phraseology, it, Jerusalem and Judea is always the city on a hill. It's always up. You're always going up to, toward um, Jerusalem. <clears throat> So just after Antioch is celebrating the return of Paul and Barnabas and the good news that the gospel uh, is proliferating, <clears throat> these, these men, uh, we don't know anything more about it, from the church in Jerusalem, come and teach uh, the Christians in Antioch, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Two, therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. All right, so here, so they, they decide to go to Jerusalem. This is an issue <clears throat> in which clearly they, they're not on the same page. The church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch are not on the same page. And, you know, here, one of the reasons uh, that this chapter is so important <clears throat> is because it, it it forms the basis uh, so for our ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is a fancy way of saying the study of what the church is. What is the church? How does it operate, et cetera? So, you know, in, in modern Protestant ecclesiology, <clears throat> especially here in the South, we're used to a dominant strain uh, is, uh, let's say, Southern Baptist, which is congregationalist, congregationalist, meaning that each individual uh, congregation, church with a small c, uh, can decide issues on their own. So if they uh, decide as a particular congregation, First Baptist of Birmingham or whatever the church, whatever they decide goes. And then they enter into kind of loose associations uh, with other churches of a similar mind. <clears throat> and they tolerate um, some deal of some degree of, uh, of, of difference, but they insist on finding certain core agreements. <clears throat> and if they share these core agreements, then they are free to enter into this association. But the association, the Southern Baptist Convention, for example, doesn't really, doesn't have any authority um, from top down. It's simply, the power is from bottom up. <laughs> they may discuss these issues uh, among themselves there, but they're not binding in any kind of way. So the, the church, our, the Orthodox Church's ecclesiology, as we can see here from the description given to us in Acts 15 of what is called the Jerusalem Council. This is what's coming up. <clears throat> this shows us uh, the Orthodox Church's ecclesiology. So you have, and we've seen so far that, that the church is led by the spirit, <clears throat> right? So... Uh, when when the message, let's say, uh, between two different churches, which are led by the Spirit, seem in some way to, to disagree, they we can see here they stop everything and resolve it, right? <clears throat> uh, this can't go on. It's extremely important that they find a unity in this. Uh, they can't just say, well, we decided this and you decided that. We decided we're going to let Gentiles um, come in without circumcision. If the, any Gentiles happen to come to you in Jerusalem, there you can do whatever you want with them. But we all agree that, you know, if we confess Jesus as Lord with our lips, that we'll be saved. And so we can all just kind of go along and get along. <clears throat> this is not the case here. Not the case. It's very important that they resolve this issue as a church, a universal church with a capital C. So this informs our ecclesiology, how we view ourselves. <clears throat> so, you know, they, so these, these, unnamed men from uh, Judea, Jerusalem, come up to Antioch, and they're sort of surprised at what's going on. Now, you may say, well, what about Peter? Peter already had this issue in Jerusalem with, in his encounter with Cornelius, and he also got some, some blowbacks, some pushback from the, the Jews, the Christian Jews, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. But you know, the, the vision that was given to Peter directly from God, the voice of God speaking to him, the, 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 the clarity with which um, it was revealed that the Holy Spirit was operating in Cornelius and these pagans <laughs> was kind of like, all right, well, it's clear that God's at work here and this is a one-off exception. And so the Jerusalem church accepted it. But now, uh, now all of a sudden, you know, Paul and Barnabas are going out uh, and trying to convert people and then accepting them without any kind of 
uh, preconditions, it seems. And so this is troubling to them. They say, whoa, okay, now, now this is different. The one thing was an exception. Now you're going out and preaching it as the norm. <clears throat> Soon we're going to be flooded with uh, non-Jews, not, not practicing uh, the, the Torah as we have become used to. Um, so we, we're raising an objection. <clears throat> So they go to Jer they travel to Jerusalem uh, to the apostles and elders. So the word elders is presbyters. Here you see apostolos que presbyteros. So this is the word apostles and presbyters. This is the word we use still in Greek for the uh, uh, for priests. The presbyters are the priests. So technically, you know, I'm a presbyter. <clears throat> So they go to the apostles and the presbyters about this question. Now the presbyters also, this is the word used in the Old Testament, the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for the elders, the 70 or 72 elders uh, that are, um, that Moses gets as his helpers. <clears throat> uh, when he says, it's too much for me to bear these people, God takes a portion of the spirit from him and gives it to the 70 or the 72 elders, presbyters, of the Jewish people, and that becomes the basis for the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the one that tried Jesus, for example, and also the apostles were brought before that Sanhedrin. <clears throat> so the same model of having um, presbyters and a council uh, seems to be just assumed in the early church. The church was led by apostles and presbyters. <clears throat> All right, verse three. So being sent on their way by the church, in other words, being sent from the church of Antioch. And what they mean being sent on their way probably means uh, you know, giving them enough uh, food and money to make this trip all the way down to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so being officially sent as a delegation from the church of Antioch, they pass through Phoenicia and Samaria. So Phoenicia is that area uh, along the coast. <clears throat> so sort of modern day Lebanon and Samaria, which was just below uh, Galilee, where Jesus was raised, in between Galilee, where Jesus was raised, and Judea, where Jerusalem is located, this area of Samaria. So Phoenicia and Samaria, in other words, areas that are not pure uh, Jewish strongholds, <clears throat> but areas where the gospel has already spread. We learned earlier in Acts that after the persecution of Stephen and his martyrdom, that the church, many of the uh, Christians, uh, especially the Hellenized Christians, uh, fled from Jerusalem and spread with them the gospel to places it mentions specifically Phoenicia and Samaria. So, so Paul and Barnabas and this delegation as they're, they're traveling south from Antioch down to Jerusalem, and this would be a logical path they would take. They pass through these areas where the gospel is already spread and where there's, and it's also a not purely Jewish uh, Christianity. <clears throat> And they're describing the conversion of the Gentiles, it says. So they're describing what happened when they went on their missionary journey to Galatia. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. So they're seeing here that there's, there are some who are not happy about this development of the Gentiles accepting Jesus. <clears throat> These are the uh, more traditional Jews centered around Jerusalem. But elsewhere, uh, outside of this kind of stronghold in the Holy Land, we get the sense that uh, from those places where there's mixed population, they all see this as a very positive development. They're not concerned. <clears throat> all right, verse four. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. <clears throat> so again, they report the success of their missionary journey. But so, and you would expect that the response they've been getting, remember at the end of Acts 14, they did this in Antioch, they rejoiced. They passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, they, they report that the Christians, they rejoice. So they hit Jerusalem again, they report this important news, but you, and you would expect the same pattern to follow where, and the brethren rejoiced, right? <clears throat> Which we've just read twice in quick succession, but what does it say instead? Verse five, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, meaning believed in Jesus, rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So these are not happy uh, about the conversion of the Gentiles, or maybe it's not fair to say they're not happy. Um, they may be happy, but they have some reservations about the way it was done. 
Are these the ones called the Judaizers, Father? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. That's a really it's a really complicated question. Um, yeah, you could you could say that, but it's it's probably too early to use that term. I mean, later we use that term. <clears throat> um, right now, right now they're just working this all out. You know, there hasn't been a decree to this point. They've been following the spirit, and then. So these amazing things are happening by the work of the spirit, but there hasn't been any, no one is, is purposely going against someone else. <clears throat> so it's not yet clear what this means. We're going to see what Judaizer means. And this is not an issue. This, I, this idea of what does it mean to be a Jew? What does it mean to be a Christian? This, this whole, that whole question of that, of identity, it does not, is not limited to this first century period. It goes on for 400 years. Uh, so we even have St. John Chrysostom around the year 400. He delivers a series of homilies called Against the Judaizers. Um, and again, the, the way they translate that is problematic, but apparently even, so in Antioch, the same city <clears throat> that Paul and Barnabas were in, 400 years later, they're still grappling with this question of what does it mean to be Jewish? What does it mean to be Christian? Because there were some pious Christians there 400 years later who were st go still going to the synagogue on Saturday and then going to the church on Sunday. Uh, and St. John uh, has to uh, explain to him, he has to kind of thread the needle exactly as what's happening, what's going to happen here. What does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to be Jewish? <clears throat> So, and the Pharisees, I mean, some might be surprised that, look, so early on here, we're talking, we're probably in the mid 40s, something like that. <clears throat> There's, uh, there are many Pharisees who have become Christian. And you think, wow, that really is kind of surprising, because you think of all the times in the Gospels where Jesus is so harsh to the Pharisees, it's, they seem to be his kind of uh, arch nemesis, right? <clears throat> and, and it's them, uh, who they become Christian, but it's really not that clear cut. I mean, <clears throat> Jesus is harsh with them, but not necessarily because they're so far away, but be maybe because, you know, a lot of times the closer we are in a position uh, to someone, the more vehement our disagreement. Um, <clears throat> so he, Jesus actually never says, in fact, he goes, he's very clear. He says the, the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, do what they teach, <clears throat> right? Listen to them, but don't do as they do. His criticism of them is not so much what they teach about the law, is that they're hypocrites, that they don't do the things that they say. <clears throat> so uh, the Pharisees, though, were uh, one of the sects that was very adamant about their belief in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, whereas the Sadducees, for example, were adamant against it. <clears throat> so just on that alone, which seems to be a main point of contention, uh, the Pharisees, you can see why they would be very open to Christianity, because uh, Christianity is uh, very much in favor of this idea of the resurrection of the dead, and that already it's begun with the resurrection of the Lord, who's the Messiah. <clears throat> But the Pharisees also, and Paul was a Pharisee, <clears throat> but Paul, of course, had a, a different experience, his conversion on the road to Damascus. <clears throat> so the Pharisees are these law-abiding Jews. They are generally, you could picture them as being more educated in the law uh, and in the rabbinical interpretations of the law <clears throat> and in the details of the, of the Mosaic law than the average person. So if you think of someone like most of the apostles, like Peter and Andrew and James and John, they were fishermen all the way in Galilee. The Pharisees were, were the people based right around Jerusalem mainly. That was their, their main center. <clears throat> so these are you know, very, very pious Jews and, and scholars. And part of the criticism is, you know, of Jesus's criticism of the Pharisees is that they spend all this time studying the law, uh, and this becomes kind of the characteristic of the Pharisees who then morph into the rabbis and, and to modern Judaism is that their mentality is that they study the law. They study the law. They study the law <clears throat> to know it like the back of their hand so that they can, and they consider it a, a good thing 
to be able to sometimes circumvent what seems to be the requirements of the law by their knowledge of the law. Uh, and there's this famous story that the rabbis tell of a time, and I, I forget what the details were, but you know, there was some seemingly plain requirement of the law, you know, don't do this, don't eat this, <clears throat> and they, or um, you know, don't ask for, you know, if once money is lended, um, you know, at the at the seven years, you have to to write it off. Well, they would find, you know, these were unpleasant things, right? So they would find ways around them and they would resort to, you know, well, if you look over here in the law and you combine it with this and you combine it with this and this and this and this, and they use the same word, really, and then they would kind of do these verbal gymnastics showing off their knowledge and the end result would be uh, they could do what they wanted, that they're saying, well, look, the law actually does allow for me to keep that debt on the books and collect from them. <clears throat> um, so this, they twisted the law, Father, they twisted the law for their own benefit, right? Well, I mean, they wouldn't put it that way. You know, they would say in their view, especially, you know, and they're developed, Pharisees are developing in the synagogue. Um, <clears throat> they are at odds with the priests. Uh, you know, they're perfect in perfect position once the temple's destroyed and there are no sacrifices to be able to say, look, you know, the essence of Judaism is not in the sacrifices in the temple. We can't do that anymore. The essence of Judaism is in the law. And by just immersing ourselves in the written law <clears throat> and knowing it like the back of our hands, uh, that's how we grow close to God, not through sacrifices. <clears throat> and so for them and their understanding to be able to say um, that they know it so well that they can kind of make all these maneuvers. It's a sign of their piety that they, and this, this rabbinic story I started to refer to, you know, it tells a story about these rabbis who did these gymnastics and got around <laughs> something. And then the, the story says that the voice of God comes out and God laughs and says, ha ha, my, my children have outdone me. My children have outwitted me. Um, and this is cited with approval by the, the rabbis in the modern Jewish tradition as showing uh, that they, 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 they beat God. You know, they, they knew the scriptures so well that they were able to um, outwit him. <laughs> okay. But that he, his hands were kind of tied. And he said, well, you know, you, you've interpreted, you've read the law correctly and you found a way to make that argument effectively. Uh, good for you. It shows the... It shows how deeply you've immersed yourself in the scriptures. That's why, you know, personally, I mean, if you look at some of the Protestant denominations, to me, they're the ones who say like, oh, the church, you know, people who go to the Catholic church or Orthodox church, they're Pharisees. Well, I mean, if you actually know what the Pharisees did and what their mentality was, it's actually really the modern day Protestants who are really a lot like the Pharisees because, you know, the Pharisees, uh, you know, would find all these, they would know the scriptures like the back of their hands and find all these creative ways to um, get to the conclusion they wanted. So the same way, like if you start listening to some of these guys, the dispensationalists and the pre-tribbers and the, all this, all this baloney, I mean, it's the same thing. They're like, well, if you take these three words from First Thessalonians and you take these six words from the Old Testament, it was written, you know, 1500 years earlier, and you combine it with this, da, 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 da. <clears throat> it means that, you know, it means that, you know, there's going to be a rapture and it's going to look like this exactly. Da, 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 da. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> uh, it's hard for me to, to buy into some of these interpretations. <clears throat> All right. So anyway, but the Pharisees, I mean, the Pharisees are not making an unreasonable argument here. They're simply saying it's not, if they're going to become Jews, they need to be circumcised and become normal Jews and keep the law. <clears throat> All right. So now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. <clears throat> so they came together. There's this official gathering. This is why it's called the Jerusalem Council. And this becomes the model for the church's mechanism of solving all uh, further disputes. <clears throat> this is the model. Uh, so this isn't the first ecumenical council, but this is the model the church uses when it convenes the first ecumenical council in 325. And it follows the same pattern. So they came together, set verse seven. And when there had been much dispute, so in other words, everyone is allowed to speak. Uh, all the parties are allowed to speak. Uh, and the, the leaders kind of hold back. <laughs> they speak last. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, 
You know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, a Gentile should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So he's referring back to the incident in chapter 10 with Cornelius. This is the third time he's going to retell, uh, we're going to, it, that St. Luke is going to retell the story of Cornelius, which signals to us it's very important. This is a foundational story. He's going to do it in the most concise way now this third and last time. <clears throat> Eight. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. So again, this is what he said before uh, about this incident with Cornelius, <laughs> that just as uh, God gave the apostles the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, back in chapter 2, he saw with his own eyes God give these Gentiles in the house of Cornelius the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> nine and made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith so he's saying god who knows the heart he purified their hearts by faith so the fathers may talk a lot about this saying that you know it was no longer uh, necessary that they uh, have the ritual uh, washing <clears throat> or that they be circumcised but that god knows the hearts of man uh, and therefore if they're if they have faith this faith is now what purifies their heart god sees that purity god sees that faith and he decides to give them the holy spirit <clears throat> 10 now therefore why do you test god by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear so in other words he's pointing to god's again through his story of cornelius they eventually they accepted his explanation of why he did what he did, why he ate with these Gentiles, because he said, look, it was, I saw with my own eyes the spirit operating the exact same way it did to us at Pentecost. How could I deny it? And they accepted. <clears throat> but I think the key to the understanding the argument is they accepted that as an exception to the rule. They weren't prepared for it to become kind of doctrine. And then what's more, not only just to accept people who happen to come, but to go out and actively seek people uh, to come. Again, I kind of see a little bit of a similarity. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. I'm a little bit confused here because I thought, um, why, why would these Pharisees, Pharisee, uh, Pharisaical Christians want um, converts to go through circumcision? That's a Jewish thing. That's not a Christian thing. <laughs> well, you, you're getting ahead of us. That's that's a later decision that hasn't happened yet. That's why we, we got to read this. So you got to hold off. This is this, that has not been decided yet. In their mind, there there have been converts to Judaism all throughout before Christ, before Christianity, and they were not allowed to become full members of uh, the Jewish people until they were circumcised and and took on the law i mean that was the way it was it always had been it was it would be similar to saying now you know the way that you become a member of our orthodox church is to be uh, baptized and or chrismated into the orthodox church <clears throat> and all of a sudden for someone to say well you know i saw people you know acting orthodox and making the sign of their cross in the orthodox way and they were never baptized or chrismated right and so you would imagine some some of people in our church would object, right, and say, well, you know, that's that may be, but that's not the normative way that we've done things in the past. And so we would at least need to get together and discuss this, right? <clears throat> the other side may say, well, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit em empowered them to act that way. And so it must be that, you know, the Holy Spirit's decided they don't need to be baptized and chrismated to be Orthodox anymore. So this is something similar to what was happening there it was always done by circumcision and in fact it was a big obstacle to there were this there were this, there was this class of gentiles who were interested in uh judaism especially in these uh areas around the mediterranean not in the holy land where they would go to synagogue and, and they were interested in this religion of the jews but many of them wouldn't take that step as adult males to be circumcised and to take on the whole law. <clears throat> so this was an obstacle that the Jews had never given in on before. So uh, excuse me. When would they do it now? I'm confused, Father, because why did, I, I still don't understand why they're insisting on these converts taking, uh, doing this necessary steps to become a Jew when they're not trying to become a Jew. 
<laughs> well, you... that's, I think, Father, don't you think they were still thinking of themselves as Jews, not as a separate sect? Absolutely. Uh, they were... You know, they, they, they thought they were the Jews who found the Messiah, but they were Jews. Correct. And, and that's the thing, the mentality they had. I don't think they had conceived yet the idea this is going to break away from Judaism completely and become a world religion and faith. Uh, and that Judaism becomes part of the background or the, uh, the foundation that no longer has meaning to most of the Christians. You're reading back 2,000 years of history into the mid 40s when you know the, all these things that are obvious to us now weren't obvious then, and that's actually the purpose of this of this council that they're having is the decisions they're going to make here is then becomes normative and what we consider normative, but it hasn't happened yet. You just got to hold off for a minute. <clears throat> but yeah, they do not conceive themselves as no longer Jews. No way. They consider themselves 100% Jews who happen to believe in the that the Jewish Messiah has come and his name is Jesus. <clears throat> All right. So yeah, this is this kind of, it's a false dichotomy between the gospel and the law that's been kind of put to us now as modern Westerners as a result of the Protestant Reformation. So you, you have these two, <clears throat> usually the Protestant Reformation has taught us to see this whole narrative as you know, there's two, two clear, stark choices, black and white. <clears throat> On the one hand, you have, you reject, you reject the Old Testament, uh, the law, you reject it completely. It's totally worthless now. As soon as Jesus came, totally worthless. You don't do anything with it. You know, Jesus has come. It's just faith. Forget the law. On the other hand, you have a, uh, supposedly this view that, <clears throat> well, nothing really changed. Uh, you know, the, the law is still in force. Uh, you should keep all the, the Jewish laws and simply also believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, the problem is that <clears throat> that's a false dichotomy. And we're going to see here in the Jerusalem Council, it's been misread uh, by the Protestants. There is no decision here that, you know, well, we're just going to chuck the whole law and it's totally worthless now. That never happens. Never. <clears throat> uh, there's a, you might call it a compromise that happens now. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. So Peter's saying, you know, why are he, Peter is saying, <clears throat> look, we've seen, we saw in the past in my encounter with Cornelius that uh, God saw into their heart. He saw the faith they had and he gave them the Holy Spirit directly without having to become Jews first uh, through the old way of becoming Jews. Uh, so now, why are you uh, tempting God, testing God? Um, uh, putting God to like, it's the same word as uh, uh, putting him to trial. Uh, you know, why are you putting God on trial uh, <clears throat> by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples? So this idea of a yoke on the neck is a, was a common metaphor by this time for uh, the law. Right. And so Jesus's disciples uh, and, and Jesus himself talks about his yoke being light and easy. <clears throat> right. But uh, there's a, a yoke in any case, meaning that which leads us, <laughs> right? So Peter's saying, well, why do you want to put this, the, the heavy yoke <clears throat> of the current kind of um, uh, understanding, interpretation of the law <clears throat> on, on the necks of these new disciples when none of us were, were able to bear it? <clears throat> meaning um, that if we look at our own behavior, uh, we haven't really been able to fulfill all the aspects of this interpretation of the law, this rabbinical kind of pharisaical interpretation of the law. <clears throat> and this is what Jesus points out. He doesn't say that the Pharisees are ever wrong, remember, about their interpretation. He says they just don't do it. <clears throat> so, all these kind of interpretations that they produce, they can produce interpretations for other people to follow, but when it comes to them, they find ways around it. So he's saying, you know, all these interpretations that you guys are coming up with, you know, we don't follow them. You guys come up with it, ways to get out of doing them. <clears throat> so why is it you want to put this on the Gentiles now? 
He says, 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So now he's really flipping it. He's saying, we'll be saved in the same way that they're saved, rather than you know, they'll be saved the same way we're saved. He's putting himself in the, in the Jews in the kind of the secondary position. All right, so then verse 12. <clears throat> then all the multitude kept silent. All right, so now, so this is the, the end of the debate is coming. Remember, it said before there, there's all this dissension and debate. <clears throat> People are allowed to freely express themselves. Then the leaders speak up. Now, you would think, in term, talking in terms of ecclesiology here, <clears throat> that if we accept with the Catholics that Peter uh, alone held the keys to the kingdom and that he is God's, uh, he is Christ's vicar on earth, then the story really should end here, right? The council should be over. Peter has spoken, <clears throat> uh, but yet it doesn't. Uh, the, the, it goes on. So, and in fact, it doesn't end until James speaks. <clears throat> so, let's just keep that in mind. But, uh, you know, Peter doesn't say, well, brethren, you remember that when I speak uh, authoritatively within a council like this, it's infallible. Uh, no, no one's referring to that right now. <clears throat> so, but they listen to his words. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened now to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So Peter is on the same side as Paul and, the, uh, and Barnabas <clears throat> in favor of the Gentiles. 13, and after they had become silent, in other words, after they had spoken, and so everything's going now in a very orderly way. Everyone's given a chance to speak. Uh, so Peter speaks because of his uh, position. Uh, Paul and Barnabas speak as almost witnesses, <clears throat> uh, testifying also to what God has done. Peter reminds them of his testimony of what God had done, what he saw with his own eyes. So after they, Paul and Barnabas, had become silent, James spoke or answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me. All right, now this is the conclusion. James is the one who is clearly in charge of the church in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, a lot of people wonder about this. When, when did this happen? So it's a very, very early tradition of the church that James was the kind of undisputed leader of the Jerusalem church, um, not Peter. <clears throat> Uh, everyone looked up to him. He's the, the so-called brother of the Lord, the stepbrother of the Lord. But there's nowhere in the Gospels that records uh, Jesus passing this mantle on to him. <clears throat> so what happened? Paul, if you remember, Paul describes in one of his letters, he describes the appearances of the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and he mentions specifically his appearance to James, right? Mm -hmm. now, this isn't mentioned anywhere outside of Paul's epistle, but he mentions that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus appeared to James. And that's all he says. <clears throat> the tradition of the church, which is as far back as we can go, we can trace it to 100, 125, which is about as early as we can go and be definitive. <clears throat> the tradition of the church was that Jesus in this resurrection appearance gave James authority over the church in Jerusalem. And this was the commonly accepted uh, tradition <clears throat> in the first century. But it's not, that's not written anywhere. <clears throat> and we don't know that James even believed in Jesus before he appeared to him after the resurrection, because from the what I recall, his brethren did uh, uh, coax him to go to Jerusalem, remember, and, and do his miracles out there because I don't think they believed in him uh, until after the resurrection and his appearance to James. And like you said, that was the only reference about James, uh, of, of, about the risen Christ uh, appearing to James, but except in one of the letters. And we don't know how and when and what and whether he appointed him as head of the church in Jerusalem. Right. I often wondered about that um, because I, that no one could answer me whether they have any more knowledge about how he appeared to them or when and what did he say. Yeah, and the the so the the idea about his family, you know, that comes from one very small passage, <clears throat> um, and I would hesitate. The Protestants really make hay uh, with that one passage. I mean, they just go nuts with it, pointing. Because for some reason they're obsessed with with downgrading the Virgin Mary, um, 
and any kind of you know human tradition, et cetera. <clears throat> so they'll really go nuts on that and show how his family mocked him and blah, 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 blah. I mean, if you read the the Greek, it's not so uh, it's not so bad. It does it does appear that you know they certainly weren't his disciples yet. <clears throat> That's not quite as bad as kind of the the normal narrative would make it seem. But in any case, they're they're not his disciples at that point. Uh, and at some point later, that's not recorded. <clears throat> it seems they become at least James. So it appears that probably the most likely point would be at this resurrection appearance that Paul alludes to. All right, so James here is speaking. He says, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon, so he's calling Peter by his uh, Aramaic name. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, meaning for a, a people for his glory. Now, the interesting thing is here look, is looking at how he uses these words. <clears throat> so, yeah, here in Greek, lavin ex ethnon laon. So lavin taking ex out of ethnon the nations the Gentiles the ethn the ethnicities the nations laon a people. So ethnon and people these are two. I mean, if you look at the Old Testament, <clears throat> these are two uh, opposed concepts, right? The, the laon, the people, God makes Israel a people. They weren't a people. He makes them a people. He makes them his chosen people out of this kind of, uh, out of all the nations. <clears throat> so now James, interesting, he's saying that just as he took out of everyone, they were all together, he took out of the nations Israel and made them an actual people, <clears throat> his people. Now, the same thing God's doing again. He visited the Gentiles, meaning everyone else except the Jews, and made them a people now <clears throat> to take out for, of them a people for his name. So in other words, he's taking, James is saying that God is is taking Gentiles and adding them to his chosen people, his special people, Israel. He's adding them in to make them an actual people now. <clears throat> for his and why is he doing it? For his name, for his uh, for his glory. <clears throat> Fifteen. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. <clears throat> so now he's looking to scripture, and he goes now to Amos, Amos uh, chapter nine. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David. So what, meaning what? So this, this is located uh, after the destruction of the first temple, <clears throat> uh, the Babylonian exile. And when the people of Israel return, we're talking you know, 500 something BC, that they will build a new temple. So uh, this is a quoting from the prophet Amos at that time. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Now, notice he doesn't say the temple. He doesn't say the temple of David because David actually, and we've, remember, we've, we've seen this argument before. There's something important going on here for the early Christian understanding that David <laughs> never built God a temple. <laughs> David always had this tabernacle, a skinin, a tent. Uh, which is the word used here. It's his son Solomon who builds him a temple, and God seems to kind of consent, maybe perhaps even reluctantly consent to the good intention here and accept this temple. <clears throat> but it really wasn't commanded by God. God commanded a tabernacle so that he would always be on the move with his people, Israel. So God says, you know, after this, after the Babylonian exile, the destruction of the first temple, <clears throat> that I, God, he had left the temple. Because of the people's iniquities, he withdrew from the first temple and he allowed the Babylonians to come in and capture the people and destroy that temple because of Israel's sins and iniquity. Now, through the prophet Amos, he, he comforts the people in this time, 500 something BC, and, and promises, I will return. I will come back and dwell among my people and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up <clears throat> so that the rest of mankind, so that the purpose of him doing this is that so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. This is the prophecy from Amos. So he's going to rebuild this tabernacle of David. <clears throat> now, the way that Christians 
the fathers interpret this is that Jesus is the new temple. The body of Jesus is that, you know, it says at the beginning of John that God came and dwelt, tabernacled uh, among them, <clears throat> that Jesus himself in the human flesh is this new tabernacle of David because he's the uh, of the line of David. So that Jesus in his human flesh, he becomes the fulfillment of this prophecy of Amos, <clears throat> not necessarily the second temple that was rebuilt. And why? What's the point of, of God doing this through Jesus? So that the rest of man, mankind may seek the Lord. <clears throat> so again, remember from the beginning, the purpose of God taking out Israel uh, and making Israel people was so that the rest of the world would see them and see their holiness and be drawn to, to, to the Lord, the one true Lord. <clears throat> So the reason that he's going to fulfill this promise now in Jesus's body is so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So not necessarily all the Gentiles, but all the Gentiles who are called by his name. <clears throat> and the way the fathers, uh, our church has always interpreted this is how, uh, how are Gentiles, how have Gentiles been um, called by his name in order to join this new uh, tabernacle of David, the body of Jesus Christ, which is his church, the Orthodox church, where there we are called when we're baptized, we're called by his name in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. We're baptized, right? <clears throat> That's how we're called by God's name into this new tabernacle that God is setting up with Jesus. So the coming of the Gentiles has been prophesied from the early, from the beginning. From, yes. And, and I, I think it goes back to Abraham, who was not particularly, well, they can't call Abraham Jewish because the Judaic tradition, Ju Judah had not been born. No, and, yeah. yet, and yet Abraham, who was Chaldean actually, who yeah. received God and the father of many nations, was not just going to be the father of the Jewish people, although they came from his loins, as we say, but so did Esau and, and, and uh, Ishmael. And so this was the prophecy was from the beginning that the, the whole world will get to know God that when he God's chooses purpose. to bring them in. That was God's purpose, but it had been perhaps you could say obscured <laughs> by this kind of nationalism uh, of the Jews. Uh, yes their interest in kind of, um, you know, making it all about them and their customs and, you know, the promises that were made to them. <clears throat> and they stopped really caring so much. They would, they would tolerate non-Jews uh, becoming uh, Jews, <clears throat> but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't their main interest, even though it was really God's purpose all along, but that had become obscured. You know, the same thing we can say again to kind of bring it home about our Orthodox Church is that you know, sadly, our attitude is somewhat similar, you know, that we tolerate non-Greeks or non-Russians or whoever uh, coming into the church, but we don't really actively seek it, you know, <laughs> we're not, we're not going out and actually evangelizing like Paul and Barnabas went out at the direction of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> right, we, we tolerate it, so something similar, we've kind of maybe lost our way, lost our calling, and kind of like the Jews tend to just focus on, you know, well, we're orthodox and you know it was given to the greek people and it was given to the russian people <clears throat> all right so so james is still speaking here in his summation he quotes amos <clears throat> 18 known to god from eternity are all his works therefore i judge that we should not trouble those from among the gentiles who are turning to god but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols from sexual immorality from things strangled and from blood. <clears throat> All right, so this is the second really important thing uh, in Acts 15. One the, is the overall model that we're seeing here in Acts 15 of how disputes are adjudicated in the church. This becomes the model. This becomes the church's, this is the church's self-understanding of what it means to be the church. <clears throat> this is how things are decided. James seems to function as this first among equals. Everyone is gathered. Everyone is allowed to speak. The leaders speak last. <clears throat> and then they, what they try to do is sum up what they're hearing from everybody. And what James proposes here is really a compromise. It's a compromise. Now, sometimes it's been taken to mean that, okay, he's throwing out the, the law. He's not doing that. And I'll explain. <clears throat> 
So, and they, and he says, therefore I judge. And he, you know, in other words, I've heard all of the uh, uh, opinions <clears throat> and here's my, here's my take. So it's similar to, um, it's not necessarily an authoritative, you know, this is how I want things. He's acting as uh, a father of a household uh, was expected to act and is expected to act in, in our day. <clears throat> in other words, the father of the household is, is, uh, has authority, but it's a, it's a grave responsibility. Um, like St. Gregory the Theologian, I was saying yesterday in the, in the liturgy, you know, he fled from the priesthood. When he found out that his father wanted to ordain him a priest, he ran away and he hid for three months because he, he fled from the responsibility of the priesthood. He called it a tyranny, <clears throat> right? So uh, the same thing here, the, the position of authority is really one of, of a terrible responsibility. It's the same in a, a father in the household. He takes everyone's views into account. And then he says, okay, here's what I think is going to be best for the household moving forward. He doesn't necessarily say, this is what is best for me. And that would be a, a bad use of his authority. He says, this is what I think is going to be best for our household. <clears throat> and here James is speaking for the household of faith as the first among equals. And this is the orthodox model of how councils work. <clears throat> All right, so he says, uh, so what are the things that he says here in verse 20? <clears throat> and this has led to a lot of uh, discussion. So he's talking about abstain from things polluted by idols. <clears throat> Meaning he means he means food sacrificed to idols. And in, and in practice, he really means meat sacrificed to idols because, you know, there were grain offerings and so on, but the amount of grain that was offered was a small amount. It would be all burnt up. <clears throat> the sacrifices of animals, however, only a portion of the animal would be sacrificed, the fat and so on, and the meat would be left over. So this is really the, the, what's problematic. So what he's really saying here is abstain from things polluted by idols, meaning meat, that had been sacrificed uh, to idols, from sexual immorality, <clears throat> from things strangled, and from blood. So the last two really are kind of the same, things strangled and from blood, because throughout the Old Testament, it's very clear that it says again and again that the life of things is in the blood. <clears throat> blood was considered the life force. That's what was, what was sacred and dangerous also at the same time, powerful. So when he's saying strangled, strangled meaning that if an animal were strangled, then necessarily it wouldn't have its blood let out. The blood would still be in the meat. <clears throat> and this was what was, was troublesome. That blood had to be drained out. The meat had to be blood free. So now where does he get these, these basically three things? <clears throat> against the idols, <clears throat> against sexual immorality, and against eating blood in any kind of meat, whether it had been sacrificed to idols or not. So the th there's some speculation that a lot of times you'll read the commentary that, well, this is based on Genesis chapter nine <clears throat> and God, uh, God's kind of covenant with Noah after the flood. Now this is long before the law comes, right? Um, and it's true that the rabbis uh, develop um, a lot of, uh, what's the word? <clears throat> the rabbis really kind of focus on Genesis 9, and there were really seven things that were required um, during with this covenant with Noah, which is interpreted as kind of this covenant with all of this renewed humanity after the flood. <clears throat> but it doesn't seem, that's a later development. Um, that the rabbis make after this, after the first century. So it doesn't seem like this is primarily where James is getting these from. Instead, and here's the really interesting thing. <clears throat> if you look in the holiness code, <clears throat> right, the holiness code is in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 17 and 18. Uh, it talks about, you know, what needs to be avoided, etc. cetera. <clears throat> um, the dietary regulations, the taboos. So uh, throughout the holiness code, which is extremely important, God says to Moses, go and speak thus to the sons of Israel, right? Go and speak thus to the sons of Israel. You shall not, you shall, uh, not eat shellfish. They are an abomination, right? <clears throat> now, in that, then there's all these regulations of things they are to avoid. To the sons of Israel, he says this. But in that 
in that speech in 17 and 18 Leviticus, there are three places where instead of introducing the commandment with the formula, go and speak thus to the sons of Israel, he says, go and speak thus to the sons of Israel and the resident alien who dwells among you. <clears throat> and the resident alien or foreigner or stranger who dwells among you. And the, the Greek word to translate this is proselyte, <clears throat> which comes to mean convert. So what it's talking about in the Old Testament is any uh, non-Jew who had come to dwell among Israel. <clears throat> now, it could, have meant, it could mean someone who had not officially become Jewish, uh, but it comes to mean proselyte. They, take, they use this word, and, and it comes to mean the word, the straight translation, even in modern Greek today, for convert, <clears throat> someone who became Jewish. <clears throat> So the three times that it adds this in the holiness code, <clears throat> what would you bet that those three commandments are? They happen to be, <clears throat> you shall not worship idols. So it doesn't just say uh, food, uh, sacrificed idols. It says idols in general. So in other words, if you are a resident alien, if you are a foreigner or a convert who's dwelling among the, the Jewish people, <clears throat> um, you will, um, it's, not acceptable within Israel to worship foreign gods. So you might be a foreigner, you might have your own gods, but if you're going to dwell among Israel, you cannot worship them among the Israelites. <clears throat> the second place it says is that if, if they're dwelling among the Israelites, they must abstain from sexual immorality, <clears throat> sexual immorality, pornea. And if you look at Leviticus 17 and 18, is very, very clear what he means by that. <clears throat> if you look up the definition of pornea in Greek, it's extremely clear what is meant by that. Um, basically, you know, if you have to summarize it, it means any kind of illicit sexual activity. So any activity, any, any conjugal relations outside of marriage, <clears throat> that's sexual immorality. That is what is being forbidden here uh, that was to be applied to anyone who wanted to dwell among Israel. <clears throat> Uh, and so, and then finally, from things strangled and from blood. So that's the third, the third place is where it talks about even the stranger among you shall refrain from uh, eating blood <clears throat> that has to be properly drained. So this, the theory goes, this is where James is getting this decision. He's looking back to the law. <clears throat> He's not rejecting the law. He's looking back to the law itself and seeing what God himself through Moses declared in the law about how non-Jews who want to dwell among the Israelites, these proselytes, how, what laws are commanded and enjoined upon them as a condition for dwelling among the Israelites. And so it makes perfect sense that this is what James' decision is. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, this was lost, this understanding of where James got this from, was was lost to some extent and the protestant kind of the reformation uh, understanding <clears throat> was james just just tossed out the whole law here he's just you know he's just made these up <clears throat> perhaps usually the the interpretation was from from noah in genesis 9 before the law um, and because they were inheriting this kind of rabbinic interpretation of uh, Noahic covenant. <clears throat> so James is, is basing it only on Noah before the law. And he's tossing out the whole law. <clears throat> but that is, not, in fact, not what is happening. James is looking to the law for the solution. Now, so he's striking this balance. <clears throat> it's not going to maybe fully satisfy the, the Pharisees and the, the Jewish contingent in Jerusalem but they can respect the logic. They can respect the logic because they say, okay, that, is, that does have basis in the law. So they respect his knowledge of the law, <clears throat> which they valued. Um, and then from the other side, from the Gentile side, it doesn't, and from maybe Paul's side, who, who seems to preach this kind of radical freedom from the law, it maybe is not fully satisfactory, but it seems like a, a decent compromise. <clears throat> now, there's this whole section, Acts in general, and then this section in particular on the, the Jerusalem Council is a subject of a lot of dispute and debate because there's, a, there's an issue with chronology. So that people are always trying to put together what exactly happened when. And the problem is, particularly if you look at 
Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, and Luke's account here in Acts, there are some things which seem to not make sense on first glance. <clears throat> but actually, you know, if you study it, it, it does start to make a, a little bit of sense, even if we can't ultimately decide conclusively what happened. But one of the arguments is that perhaps there were actually two councils in Jerusalem, <clears throat> and that Luke is simply, is, has simplified it and it simply recorded the, the decision from the second of those councils. So that there was an initial decision first, uh, there was some controversy about it, it comes back and they further refine it. <clears throat> But we don't know. And then another question is, too, so just talking specifically about Paul's kind of radical interpretation is, you know, one of the dis one of the big issues with Corinth, <laughs> and, and there were many issues, you know, so when you look at the Pharisees and their concern, the, the Jewish Jews, let's say, and their concern about all these Gentiles coming in and without proper kind of teaching or regulation, they're not unfounded concerns because if you look at uh, first and second Corinthians, Paul has all kinds of problems with the Corinthians, right? Who are mainly Gentiles who have become Christian. Uh, and one of those big issues was eating meat sacrificed to idols, <clears throat> right? And Paul seems to say to the Corinthians that it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. So uh, in kind of resolving this dispute there, but people will say, well, those letters to the Corinthians were written probably 10 years after the Jerusalem council. So why doesn't Paul say, Hey, look, you know, the, the council met on this. Here was the decision. He doesn't mention it at all. So then that brings a whole lot of questions about, is it because this second council hadn't happened yet? It's only as a result of the disputes in Corinth and elsewhere that they have to take into account these further, um, uh, this, this kind of further consideration. <clears throat> we don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to resolve one way or the other. All right. So, and then we'll just end here with 21. <clears throat> 21. So this is the conclusion of James' uh, speech here. <clears throat> For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So this is another one that's uh, missing, can be misinterpreted. So on the one hand, James could mean he could be saying this. He could be saying to the to the Pharisees and the Jewish Jews. He, he could say, "Look, we're not going to require them to to follow the law, <clears throat> but uh, you know, in all of these major cities around the Mediterranean, <laughs> there are synagogues uh, where he's been preached for a long time, and these Gentiles who are becoming uh, uh, Christians." They are mainly from this class of Gentiles, God fearers, who had already been associating with the synagogue, hadn't made the full conversion, but were interested in Judaism, were attending synagogue, were, were uh, benefactors and giving donors to the synagogue. And so, look, there. So, the one way you could see it is look, they still have that. So, they're going to hear the law of Moses and they'll learn. They'll learn. We don't want to have to require them to do everything all at once. But the better interpretation that makes more sense <laughs> is because these are Gentiles who had already been associated with the synagogue and had been attending the church uh, regularly, it's better to, to read it as, uh, look, they've already heard the law, right? And so that's why uh, we're requiring them to follow these elements of the law for those Israel, for those who want to dwell among the Israelites, because they know the law and they already know that this is what was expected of those who dwell among uh, the Israelites. <clears throat> so that's, there's a debate there how to, how to read that. But it's clear that James is uh, offering a, a compromise uh, that's trying to satisfy both parties. <clears throat> and it's based on the law. He's not rejecting the law. All right, so we'll end on 21 and we'll pick up on 22 when, again, it's an important kind of formulation. They write down uh, what this decree is and it becomes kind of the, the law of, of the church, uh, which we now accept as, as normative that you don't need to be circumcised. <clears throat> One question I always had, though, was, you know, and, and interestingly, in the ninth century, so we have evidence after this, starting from the second century, third century, that this was viewed as kind of the law because as the church becomes more and more driven and populated by Gentiles who are becoming Christians, not Jews who are accepting Jesus, 
um, these laws in particular become important. And so we see in law codes <laughs> them being incorporated. So even in the ninth century in England, King Alfred, he begins when, he's, when he formulates the law code in the preamble, he states that the basic presuppositions are these three things that must be avoided as, as defined in Acts 15. And then he adds also the golden rule. <clears throat> he says, this is kind of the foundation of our law. And then he goes to enumerate the specifics. So it's clear that this was seen by Gentile Christians as very important. But one, one question I already always had was, <clears throat> you know, about the blood and the meat. Why is it that we're not as Christians? Why is, why hasn't it become in our Christian culture more um, important to be careful of there being any blood in the meat? I mean, especially if you like to eat your steak, let's say rare, right? <laughs> There's still blood in there, right? And it's a clear violation of what was apparently a very important uh, decision. How is it that, you know, why is it that we just kind of overlook that one? I've, I've been curious about that. And my, my theory is that there's a, <clears throat> there's a problem here in the text between the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts. So I think I mentioned before, you have this Western text of Acts um, that's about 25 to 33% longer than uh, the the Eastern version of the text of Acts. And there's no new stories or anything there in it. It's simply um, extra adjectives, extra descriptions for the existing stories. Uh, but one of the changes in the Western text is it says, instead of saying, talking about uh, meat with blood, it just says to avoid bloodshed avoid bloodshed, which then could be interpreted and spiritualized as, you know, avoid murder, avoid warfare, those kind of things. So perhaps that's why. And then I kind of half jokingly think, you know, if you've ever been to Greece, uh, when they cook meat, they cook the heck out of the meat. I mean, they, they make it well done, which would always drive me crazy. But there's no blood left in that meat uh, after they're done cooking it. So <laughs> then I always thought, you know, maybe somehow did th th that develop as a way to safeguard against there being any blood left in the meat? I'm, I don't know. 